You're listening to Let's Chat, Stories of Fellowship, the podcast of the 2019-2020 cohort of the American India Foundation Clinton Fellows. We are a group of about 20 young professionals in various parts of the social or development sector in India. I'm Anjali Balakrishna, one of the fellows in this year's cohort, and I'm your host. Here we are chatting, or chotting, if you don't mind a good food pun, about our memories and stories from the fellowship, living and working in various parts of India. The fellowship is a unique opportunity to learn and grow through unexpected challenges, which is made for some interesting stories. Every episode stands alone with a theme that provides some loose unity, but every fellow interprets the theme in a slightly different way, leaving us with the delicious masala of storytelling. So let's dig in. Our episode today is called Auto, Stories of Movement. Auto rickshaws are everywhere in India, and they're an affordable, easy way to move around. Today, we'll take an auto on a tour of stories. There will be recalibrated itineraries, changed drop locations, and some detours along the way. When I was in India, I got stuck for a week. Not the kind of stuck where you're facing a big life decision and you don't know what to do, or the kind of stuck where you're working on a math problem or a challenge at work and you can't quite crack it. Or even the kind of stuck where you're trying to get somewhere but there are no trains, cars, planes to get you there. I literally got stuck. Can't walk, can't stand, can't move, stuck. As far as stories go, the plot is pretty basic. First, I threw out my back. Then I laid on the floor of my apartment, unable to move for about a week. Finally, my back stopped spasming, and I could stand up without immediately toppling over. It was at moments extremely painful, and at other moments, hilarious. But when you spend a week unable to move, you end up leaning on other people to do the moving for you. And I learned a lot during this week about what happens when you lean on others to get unstuck. Here are my five biggest lessons. Lesson one. Don't get a massage if you can't explain, ouch, that really, really hurts in the local language. It was the start of the week and I was still standing, but not for long. I felt my back twitching, the spasms were beginning, and I thought to myself, why not get a massage? That'll loosen things up. So I booked a massage through this incredible app that sends skilled massage therapists to your home, table and all. I limped up the stairs to my apartment, excited to get ahead of my backache with a deep tissue massage. The therapist couldn't have been nicer, and before she got started, I confidently said, Mujhe kamar dard hai, or I have a lower backache. I was so proud, smug even, that I could so clearly express what was going on. She smiled and got to work, doing her best to help. Unfortunately, my pride quickly melted away as I realized I did not have the words to tell her that if she kept twisting my spine like that, she'd have to leave the table with me because I wouldn't be able to get off of it. I'm proud to say I managed to slide off the table, pay her, and travel the meter from the table to my bed. But once I got on the bed, it was game over. I was stuck and could not get up. Lesson two, always have a native speaker on speed dial for an emergency three-way call. I didn't fully realize that I couldn't get up until I'd placed an order for pizza from my favorite New York style joint in Jaipur. I was in pain, but I couldn't wait for my Paneer Tikka pizza to arrive. The Zamata driver pulled up outside my building and called to say he was there. Eight minute, I responded confidently, planning to meet him out front. But as I tried to swing my legs around the side of my bed and stand up, I just couldn't. I mustered all the arm strength I had, but every time I got to my feet, my back spasmed and I tumbled back onto the bed. It was a scary feeling and I was panicked. What would happen to my paneer pizza? I called my mom 8,000 miles away in Memphis, Tennessee and started to sob. The Zamata driver called and I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the words to explain what was happening and to ask him to come up the stairs and deliver to my door. So I tried something bold. I merged the calls. Suddenly, my mother, a native Hindi speaker, was giving detailed instructions to my Zamata driver on where to park, how to find my gate, and how to come up to my door. I managed to pull myself up, hobble a few feet to meet him. Pizza crisis averted. Lesson three. You'll never go hungry if an Indian coworker is taking care of you. Speaking of food, I told my host site what had happened, 
and Ummel, one of my colleagues, was immediately put on food duty. He arrived the next day with dinner. He started pulling boxes out of the takeaway bag, and by the 10th box, I lost count. It seemed he was determined to make sure I really wouldn't be able to move, both because of my back and because I'd be simply too stuffed to go anywhere. Three meals a day for the rest of the week, I'm convinced I ate better when confined to the floor than I did at any other point in my fellowship. Lesson four, when you're Indian, you have an uncle literally everywhere. News of my back problems spread quickly within my extended family scattered all across the world. My aunt, my mom's brother's wife, called me right away and told me that my uncle in Jaipur would take me to the doctor the next day, that very same night if I needed it. I thought to myself, I have an uncle in Jaipur? Well, if you count your mom's brother's wife's brother's best friend as an uncle, I sure did. Without ever having met or spoken to me before in my life, this uncle took the morning off of work, had his friend drive him to my apartment, half carried me down the stairs, and took me to the local spine specialist that he knew personally. As we returned a few hours later, pain meds and hot pads in hand, I thanked him profusely. He said there was no need to thank family for such things. Lesson five, don't wait until a crisis to appreciate what you have in your life. This week could have been absolutely terrifying, and in some ways it was. It was a scary feeling to be 8,000 miles away from home and physically unable to move. But it was clear right away from the well-meaning massage therapist to my newfound uncle that there were others who would move for me. I felt less alone, less afraid, and with their help, got unstuck. Our next stop is Donald Swen. Donald worked in Bangalore with a startup called Alup, working to create regenerative economies to fight climate change. Donald is reading a poem that the fellows wrote together as a cohort during a session of our Midpoint conference in January. We were prompted to write down metaphors to describe our experiences and then pass the paper amongst ourselves so that other fellows could add lines and build the poem collectively. This is what we wrote. My project is a car in Delhi traffic, stuck and frustrated, unsure of when I will move again. The cows, the dogs, the monkeys all managed to make their way through, but I am at a standstill. At times, all I can hear are the sounds of horns. I wish I could move at the speed of their sound. Everything stops for a moment. And to me, that's a good thing. It's time for reflection. Next, we're revisiting a friend from episode two, Pallavi Deshpande. Here, Pallavi describes her work with VisionAid in Vizag, Andhra Pradesh. You never realize how much you rely on something until it's taken away from you. And yes, that's the cheesy quote with which I want to start this tale. Because in one sense, it really does encapsulate my experience with movement perfectly. It was the day of the partner training program, which was basically a two-day training where my organization invited all the partners and walked them through the various courses and interventions that were offered at my organization. I was sitting by the corner in the office when one of the instructors pulled me to her side and asked me to help her organize an orientation and mobility course demo. To those who might be unfamiliar with this, orientation and mobility teaches the visually impaired how to navigate new and challenging environments safely. The instructor walked me through some of the basics of the course and told me that I was gonna be one of the people participating in this demo. Don't worry, she'd assured me. She would be right next to me the entire time. How hard could it really be, right? Only when I put the blindfold on and was taken to a ground I'd never walked across in my life did I realize that for me, movement was almost entirely about sight. Thinking metaphorically, we call thinking ahead or planning for a goal vision. The very word is embedded in how we visualize movement, whether physical or otherwise. Now let's zoom back to that day. 
So now I'm standing somewhere between a field and a cafeteria, or so I was told, practicing using a cane and just my senses to help me find my way to this cafeteria. Of course, I was accompanied by a fellow staff member who didn't hesitate to shout stop anytime someone almost ran into a wall. I'll tell you right off the bat, no one got hurt. In fact, everyone had an incredibly fulfilling experience. The whole thing ended up being a 30 minute demo where we were taught various ways to listen for specific sounds, use canes to maximize utility, and navigate being in a completely different space. I remember one of the participants who was a part of the team, who was completely blind, and his name was Sunil, laughed at me the entire time. He was forging ahead, so attuned to having moved for as long as he'd known movement. Looking back, I think of how much fun we had, spending that entire afternoon laughing about who did better and who was a clumsy mess. I can safely say that it was one of the most valuable experiences I've had throughout my time at my host organization. It made me rethink so much of how our language and diction revolves around the assumption of sight. In general, it also made me more aware of how our language is embedded with assumptions, which in turn informs our perceptions about what is normal. All of this can entirely marginalize a community. So when I look back to that day and to those incredible memories, movement is no longer just about moving in the general sense of a physical motion or moving forward in life. Movement, in a sense to me now, is a way of envisioning freedom, whether being able to go wherever you want, moving up professionally, or building a new relationship. And that day reminded me that sight or the ability to visualize has little to do with movement, if anything at all. Movement required intention and courage. Spending that day with Sunil and hearing all about his adventures daring to step into the ocean with fellow participants later in the evening made me realize what movement truly is. Support for this podcast comes from the American India Foundation Clinton Fellowship, a fellowship where American and Indian young professionals are placed all over India to work at and support organizations in the field of public health, livelihoods, and education. I'm Anjali Balakrishna, your host, and you're listening to Let's Chat, Stories of Fellowship. Our next story is brought to you by Aishwarya Maheshwari, who spent her fellowship with Kamir, designing a range of craft products and publicity materials to support local artisans. Her project involved a lot of field work, and she was placed in an exquisite part of India, Bhuj Gujarat. She describes it using words like mystical and magical. Now, she takes us there. Being a branding and communications professional in a rural region, I knew my work would involve a lot of traveling around. The more I travel in India, the more I realize how little I know about India. Even as someone, who was born and brought up in this country, the diversity in India has always left me spellbound. Today, I'm going to share about my travels around Kutch that made my fleeting movements in the hinterland become the most awe-inspiring moments of my fellowship journey. Before AIF, I had visited Kutch in 2017 for the famous Sol Desert. So I was confident that I'm familiar with the region. After landing in Kutch in mid-September of 2019, I had a very strong preconceived notion about how triad my life would be in this small village. Honestly, I thought of Kutch as a very small region with famous salt flats like many other tourists. But little did I know how much this place had to offer. It is funny how our subconscious bias always fills in the gap even before we fully learn about something. Oh, by the way, did I tell you about this mystical place that not only homes an expansive salt desert, but also shares borders with the Arabian Sea? A desert and a sea in the same region. Fascinating, isn't it? 
that they are realized that there is so much more that exists than what meets the eye kach itself has a very special affinity with movements being an earthquake prone region kach has faced massive movements due to multiple earthquakes in the past thousand of years that have completely changed the region's geography i had heard of kach being an arid and semi arid region after all it's a desert right but my field visits turned out to be completely opposite i saw rich biodiversity all around the bunny grasslands which are asia's largest grasslands looked lush green flooded with the monsoon water it was just it was just awe inspiring and i wondered how is that possible and then i discovered the term wetlands and i wondered how is that even possible and that's when i discovered about the term desert wetlands so when i visited the salt flats again in october last year i i learned that there was water all around till the end of the horizon i was baffled wasn't there salt before over here how can a desert turn into a sea the salt flats are flooded with runoff from monsoon rains together with sea water driven by high winds and tides from the arabian sea this transforms them to marshes teeming with wildlife though i haven't seen one myself they said that the bunny grassland reserves have been identified as one of the last remaining habitats of the cheetah and the great indian bustard in fact it also hosts thousands of flamingos every year in the winter season During another field visit in the month of January 2020, I visited Dola Vira, a village in the island city of Kutch. After reaching there, I learned that Dola Vira is actually the fifth largest Harappan site from the Indus Valley civilization. History buffs, this is a treat to see. I could see the ruins of the meticulously planned citadel and city. So even our ancestors knew what a resourceful and magnificent region this is. And guess what? I also saw the wood fossils found here dating back to what, the Jurassic age? Isn't that crazy? It's absolutely fascinating how Kutch has a bit of everything. A salt desert, an island, the sea, rich flora and fauna. and i haven't even started about the ancient craft practices here it has the most magnificent crafts that are prehistoric yet practiced by the artisans with an intrinsic pride these experiences made me realize something very important that exploration is not about the place you're visiting as much as it is about the mindset you're visiting the place with every place has a lot to offer It is about how much you're ready to take in. That one place can give you a different experience each time you visit because as we grow, we evolve and we start seeing the world through different eyes. Movement is easy, but awareness with movement can open a new lens to the world and bring profound learnings. Our final stop on this auto ride is with Tenzin Tsagong. We first met Tenzin in episode 3 when we talked about her experience in the cold winters of Dharmshala. Today, she brings us into the fold of her personal identity as a Tibetan American and the sense of community that's part of her heritage. I'm sitting in the audience underneath a festive orange makeshift tent outside the grounds of the Tibetan refugee handloom's market in Old Bulgaon. one of over 200 seasonal Tibetan winter markets in India. The market is alive with music, dance, and food to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Dalai Lama's conferment of the 1989 Nobel Peace Prize. Facing me is a framed portrait of His Holiness sitting on the podium between two Tibetan flags. The smell of desi, a sweet Tibetan rice dish mixed with cashews, butter, and raisin permeates the air. Paper cups that have been filled to the brim with Tibetan butter tea are being passed around in the audience. The program's MC, Urgen Lundup, a Tibetan songwriter from Dalhousie, 
is crack jokes, seamlessly flitting between Hindi and Tibetan. The sweet buttery smell of desi and the salty aroma of butter tea transports me back home to New York, back into the halls of the Armenian church on the corner of 2nd Ave and 34th. Growing up, my family and I, in what felt like all of New York and New Jersey's Tibetan community, would congregate in these church halls to celebrate everything from Tibetan New Year to the Dalai Lama's birthday. We would wear our traditional chubas, sing traditional and modern Tibetan music, and dance korshe, a traditional Tibetan circle dance. Growing up, I don't think I really fully appreciated how special and necessary this community space was. It's only now when I look back through the rosy tint of nostalgia and a trained sociological lens that I realize how important it was and still is that Tibetan immigrants created our own world, our own Tibet inside these church walls in a city that couldn't be further and more different from Tibet. And as I'm sitting under this orange tent in Gurgaon, dressed in my chuba, laughing at Ugin's jokes, it feels as though the rest of the city sort of washes away. The noise of the car honks, the gloomy gray fog that hangs over the city, they all just disappear. Migration is a confounding blend of the sweet and the bitter, of loss, displacement, and hope. To migrate from a place, to depart, is to accept that there is no longer a world there for you, that there is no hope, so you do the only sensible thing to do, you let go. To migrate to a new foreign land is a move towards hope, towards some vision of a future, and it is only hope that can buoy an individual, a family, to undertake an act as courageous as leaving one's home, a courage that is not without fear. Leaving old worlds and creating new ones is a quintessentially Tibetan story. In fact, Tibetans are rather good at it. My Pala did so when he had to escape to Nepal when he was just a young teenager. And he did it again when he and my Amala immigrated to New York, saddled in debt, but nonetheless brimming with hope to create a better life for me and my brother, a hope that they have largely fulfilled. For Tibetans like my father and the approximately 42,000 Tibetans who annually leave their refugee settlement from October to February to participate in this market economy, there is a double layer of migration occurring. The first is a more political and forceful migration, one caused by China's violent capture of Tibet. A movement that has essentially marked our parents' and grandparents' newfound identities as refugees and shaped the rest of their lives and the lives of subsequent generations. And the second layer of movement is a more economically motivated one. Whether that's immigrating to the West or engaging in these cyclical trade markets every year. Yet, no movement exists without precarity. Not for immigrants like my parents who came to America speaking little English, nor does it exist for the Tibetan migrant traders who work in these uncertain informal economies. One moment that especially highlighted the precariousness of this business was a fire that occurred in 2016 in the Lal Kila market in Old Delhi that ravaged the entire market. Tsewang La, one of the elected officials from the Market Association, who had been working at the market since 1994, recalled to me how the fire engulfed all 138 of its stalls and the merchandise that they had brought for the season, which had only just started. Everything but the CCTV camera and the makeshift office was destroyed. When I asked Hewang La if and how this event brought them closer together, with a shy smile, he answered in the wise way we often hear from our parents. When things are easy, we forget. But when everyone's suffering, everyone comes together. Displaying a united front, the market set up a community distribution network for food, they shared the profits from the sale of the remaining goods, and collected donations from other Tibetan markets around the country. The collective support extended beyond the market community, Tibetan NGOs in India, the Central Tibetan Administration, and even the Delhi government provided relief and aid. In Tibetan, the word for association is Kiduk. Kiduks are usually organized around the basis of the region of Tibet its members are from. Ki on its own signifies happiness, duk suffering. 
Embedded in just this one simple word is this larger idea that in a union or an association, everyone is in this together, in good and bad times. Tewang La's retelling of the tragic fire illustrated a model of a community that goes beyond an amorphous sense of affinity and belonging, which while important, shouldn't be the litmus test of a community. He spoke of a community that was far more material, more tangible, one supported by action, generosity, one defined by accountability and collectivity. That Tibetans like my Pala and the thousands of Tibetan migrants in India are resilient and good at creating new worlds and new places can perhaps then be attributed to Tibetans understanding that real community can only come about from a union of Kibuk, of this blend of the sweet and the bitter. Well, friends, we've reached the end. This was our final episode, or rather, the last stop on our way back to our respective homes on our shared auto. You see, if you've needed to get around anywhere in India, you've most likely shared an auto or two, packed with three or four other people. We've enjoyed the ride, and hope you have too. The story shared today took us all over the place as we started with the flat tire, getting stuck, but then got going and picked up other fellows who defined movement, migration, and traffic in different ways. Our auto was packed, and we have finally arrived at our destination. We're sad to go, but we do have a short bonus episode coming out next week called Hindsight 2020. We included this bonus episode because when we arrive at any destination, it's important to look back at the path we took to get there. As we look back in our rearview mirrors, the fellows and I will impart some important advice for the fellows to come after us. Join us one last time as we look back upon our journey with 2020 vision. I'm Anjali Balakrishna, and I'll see you in next week's bonus episode.